Hey there, Nick Janitakis here. In this video, let's take a look at a new Flask extension that I recently released called Flask Static Digest. And in a nutshell, it does two things. It will MD5 tag and gzip your static files. Keep in mind, this is not meant to be a competitor to Webpack or Grunt or Gulp or any other build tool. This is a completely standalone tool that only does MD5 tagging and gzipping of your static files. So it's not going to create like asset bundles or anything like that. So if you are using Webpack, you can continue using it. But if you're not using Webpack, then no worries at all because this extension will work just the same. So this is one of those extensions where you'll probably want to use this in every single Flask application that you have. So while this extension is only a couple of days old here, you know, I just published it uh, a couple of days ago, you know, this is something I have been doing for years in all of my Flask applications. Also, this is something that uh, is just built into a lot of other web frameworks like Django, Ruby on Rails, Phoenix, and I'm sure there's others. So actually, in the past, I had another extension called the Flask Webpack. And if I scroll a little bit down here in the readme file, you know, there is a migration guide. So if you were using Flask Webpack, you know, that's how you would migrate to using this one. But uh, the idea what Flask Webpack was, you know, it did sort of a similar thing with the MD5 tagging, but it really leaned on having Webpack do the MD5 tagging. And Flask Webpack really only, you know, did very minor things on the Flask side of things to read in some manifest file and, you know, introduce a new static or introduce a new template helper. But, you know, in my opinion, that really was not really the way to go because uh, to make this work, it's like not only do you need to MD5 tag the files themselves, but your template helpers, they need a way to like understand how to convert like a human readable name. Like, let me just show you for an example here. Like what we're looking at is the Snake Eyes application that we build in my um, in my Flask course. But if you take a look here at the CSS links, it's like in the application itself, we have you know a main.css file and a couple of other CSS files. Like we're not using Webpack in this application yet, but uh, that is something I'm going to be adding in a free update soon. But in either case, it's like, you know, we have this like styles slash main.css. And if I go to my source code over here, which is by the way, using this new Flask Static Digest uh, extension, you'll notice here that, you know, instead of using URL for uh, inside of the Jinja2 template, I'm using static URL for. But if you look at like how this actually looks, you know, if you're familiar with using Flask, you know, this is exactly how you would define an asset in a Jinja2 template using URL for. So like you would, you know, set the endpoint to static and then you choose your file name like style slash main.css. And, you know, you're never going to have like these crazy MD5 hashes in your template. So that's kind of why there's like two sides of the story, right? It's like you need to MD5 tag the files, but then your your actual web frameworks templating engine needs to be able to convert this type of human readable name to ones that have the MD5 in the file name. In this case, those MD5 hashes are not here because I did not run the uh, compile command that this extension provides. So before we get into that, let me maybe just explain a little bit about the why, because like, yeah, this is totally something you'll want to have in every Flask project that you have. And it really comes down to like optimizing your static files for production. Like this is something you would typically do as a part of your deploy process. So, you know, I happen to be using Docker, but you know, let's just keep things a little bit simple and talk about like not using Docker for a moment. So on your server, when you deploy your application, typically you would like pip install your dependencies and then you would, you know, restart your your app server like GUnicorn or UWSGI or whatever you happen to use. So now the only difference in that deploy, like let's call it a pipeline, like a series of steps that happen when you deploy your code, it's like now you would pip install your dependencies, then you would run this new CLI command that comes a part of this extension, which is, you know, flask digest compile, which we'll go over soon. And then, you know, and then you would restart your app server. So it's really something you're meant to just run in production, but you can also run it in development just to see how it works. And, uh, you know, now would be a good time to do that. Also, like, how does it work here? Like, this is a pretty, like, TLDR version of how things work. So, like, step number one, you know, this thing does add a new command 
to the Flask binary that you can run from the terminal. So let's go and check that out. So I'm just running the application here. Let me just go to um, my courses directory for here. And I am running this in Docker, so I'm just going to do a Docker Compose exec here. And if we take a look here at the Flask binary, uh, normally, you know, you can do things like run an interactive shell, you can run your dev server, like if you're not using GUnicorn or whatever, you can show a list of routes. But now we have this new command here called digest. And this is provided by the extension that we were just talking about. And if you take a look here at this command, you know, this command actually has, uh, let me just clear that so it's on the top of the screen. So this command actually has two subcommands, like one is to compile which is gonna generate these optimized static files. And we have another command that is going to clean them. So basically getting rid of uh, those optimized files if you don't want them there, but you know your original static files aren't going to get deleted. So let's actually try compiling them first because you know you need some something to delete before you can delete them. So when you run this command here, you know it'll go and tell you, hey, you know, go check out your digested files at this path. Basically in my uh, Flask application, let me just open up uh, sidebar here. You know, I, I like to keep my static files not inside of a static folder inside my apps folder. I actually like to keep them into a public folder that lives like outside my application because these are like static files. But, you know, this extension is smart enough that it actually looks at your Flask uh, static folder configuration. So you don't even need to configure this, like it just knows. So after running this uh, digest compile command, you'll notice here that I have a manifest.json file. But if I take a look here at my styles, um, notice how instead of just having a, a main.css file, like now we have a gz file, which is the gzipped file. And we also have these files here, which are uh, the md5 tagged versions of this main.css file. And it's also gzipped as well. Like the contents of this file is no different. It's literally an identical copy of the main.css file, but it just happens to have an MD5 hash in the file name. So now if I go uh, and restart the Flask server, because the extension, it only checks for that manifest file when the application starts up. So there's really no runtime performance at all. <clears throat> you know, but that does mean when you, when you digest compile, you do need to restart the Flask application. So now let me go back to the web page here. I'm just going to reload the page. And you'll notice that from the outside, you know, the web page itself doesn't look any different. And that's what we want. But if I go and uh, view the page source here, notice now that the file names, it's no longer just, you know, main.css. It's, it's main. And then we have this MD5 hash of the file. You know, but if I click this file here, it's still the same old file. You know, no difference whatsoever. So I don't know if you know this about uh, MD5 hashing, but basically the way it works is, you know, if you take a string, like, you know, let's say the contents of a CSS file, and you run the MD5 hashing algorithm on it, it will produce like a 32 character, you know, zero through nine, A to F, like lowercase, like basically this, the A to seven all the way to the one, one. And uh, the interesting thing is like, if you run that same algorithm again on the same file, it's always going to produce this output. However, if you put uh, something different in there, let's say that you put in, you know, maybe you modify one of your background colors to the body or, you know, you modify the CS CSS file in some way, then this hash is going to be a different value completely. And this kind of goes back to like the why, like why go through the trouble of doing all of this? So it really comes down to being able to cache your assets. So typically uh, when it comes to setting up a web server in production, you really wouldn't want to expose GUnicorn to the internet directly or, you know, your Python web server. Typically, you would put something like Nginx in front of it. And uh, this video would be a million hours long if I went into detail about Nginx. So I am going to be skipping a little bit around with some high-level details. But the basic idea is you can tell Nginx to serve all of your static files directly. So if someone goes and, you know, they load, you know, your homepage, uh, for your website, and it comes down to having to load, you know, a couple of CSS files and a JavaScript file and a couple of images, you know, Nginx can actually take the responsibility of serving all of these files directly without even contacting your Flask server. You know, this way, your Flask server, the GUnicorn server, it can just happily serve the dynamic content that 
you know, like accessing your database and then showing a list of users or like whatever you're doing on your web application, like it doesn't need to waste its time serving these static files. And with Nginx, you can do some interesting things. Like you can set cache headers on these files to basically say like, look, well, actually let's talk about not using those cache header files first. So typically if you were to go to like example.com, like a website, and you will load some images there, then if you were to reload the page again in like a minute or maybe like tomorrow or whatever, like sometime in the future, uh, typically your browser will have a local copy of those files in its cache, like literally on your file system. But when you go to the page, like example.com again in the future, what typically happens is, you know, a network request will go over to you know, example.com's web server, let's say Nginx for argument's sake, because that's, you know, the web server we've been talking about, you know, Nginx will, <clears throat> will look at, will, will understand that, hey, you know, it's making a request for the CSS file or whatever. And it'll probably just serve back uh, a, a status code of a 304, which is like content not modified. Because, you know, between your browser and Nginx, it'll understand that you already have a local copy and like, let's just say, you know, in this example, the CSS file didn't change, right? So it's the same exact file. Uh, that's pretty standard behavior out of the box. But the issue with that is like, your browser still needs to make a network connection to example.com to even detect if whether or not like this file changed. But, and, and there are ways to get around that. So like what you can do at Nginx is you can set a cache header on your assets. Like let's, let's say all of your assets, right? Like all of your CSS files, all of your JavaScript files, fonts, images, etc. And you can tell Nginx to, you know, say, you know what, cache this file on the user's local device, probably their browser for like the next two years. And if anyone ever requests the same main.css file again in the future, this time there doesn't need to be an external network call to the example.com's nginx web server like it'll just immediately serve it from from the user's browser and that saves like a whole entire network round trip like that's actually pretty good like that's a pretty big win but the problem is you know if you weren't doing this md5 hashing and you just had the regular like main.css being the file name now it's kind of like well you know, if Nginx set that header to cache that file for two years and like never, ever, ever even like tell me about that file. Well, like what happens when you go to your web app and like, you know, maybe a week later you decide to make these little gray links, I don't know, like a darker gray or a button or something like that. So you make this change and you push it to your web server, but Nginx is now going to serve the old original main.css file for the next two years. And that would be a huge problem. So to get around that problem, what we do is we do the MD5 hashing of the file. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, if you were to update that file again in the future, then the MD5 hash is going to be completely different. So the file name is going to be different. And then Nginx is going to be like, oh, well, you know, now we have this new file that's not cached. Let me serve that. And your user is going to be able to see the new like buttons up here, you know, as soon as you make that change. But then when they come back in the future, like, you know, two days later, you know, if that file isn't changed, you know, it still has the same MD5 hash, then they're going to load it from their browser. So that's like a really, really big win. So now you don't, you don't even have to contact the network to serve your assets. As long as the visitor went to your site at least once and they are um, using a browser that, it, that supports caching, which most of them do, like unless they're running like in incognito mode all the time or something like that. And uh, the other benefit of using this Flask Static Digest is the gzipping. So gzipping is a compression algorithm that a lot of web servers support and browsers support it as well because it's like a two-way thing. But, you know, let's say that you have a really, really big style sheet. Like let's say you're using Webpack and you bundle it all up into like a single CSS file. And this CSS file is like, I don't know, maybe like 150K, 200 kilobytes of text. Now, if someone is on like a really crappy mobile device or, you know, any device at all, really, you know, loading 200 kilobytes over the network is, that's kind of a lot. That may take like, you know, on some devices, multiple seconds. So what you can do is you can gzip these files and get really, really good compression, especially on text. So I don't know the numbers like off the top of my head, like the exact compression ratios, but you can probably get something close to like 15 or even 20 to one. So that 200 kilobyte file at maximum gzip compression, 
might go all the way down to like 10 or 15K. Like don't quote me on those exact numbers, but you know, for sure you're gonna get at least 10 to one. So instead of transferring like, you know, 200 kilobytes over the wire, like over the network, you're only gonna have to transfer like maybe like 15 or 20. And that makes a very big difference. Now, Nginx has support for doing gzipping like on the fly. So you can configure Nginx to gzip files, but you know, if you're doing that on the fly, then then Nginx needs to actually, you know, use CPU time on your server to compress the file. And you know, there's like Nginx configuration settings where you can, you know, decide that do you want to gzip like between a number between one to ten. Like I forget the actual config values off the top of my head, but like you know, the higher you go up, like if you want to gzip it to like maximum compression ten, then that's going to use a way more CPU power than uh, like one or two. So a lot of people just put like gzip on like six or something like that, and that gives you a pretty good bang for your buck. But if you use this extension instead, you can actually like pre-gzip these files, so they're already uh, gzipped at the maximum level, and then you can just tell Nginx, hey, you know what, I still want to use gzip, but don't even bother trying to compress them on your own. Like they're already uh, pre-gzipped at the maximum amount, just serve them directly. So using a plugin like this or an extension like this, you know, you're going to save quite a lot of money on hosting when it comes to bandwidth because less bytes are going to be transferred over the wire. But uh, more importantly, because that's, you know, well, if you're dealing at crazy traffic, that could be a lot of money. But, you know, in most cases, the real benefit is your site is going to feel like it loads faster for the users of your site. So, you know, that was a very long why. I'm looking at the video 16 and a half minutes now, but <clears throat> I feel like the why is super important because, yeah, you will want to use this in your Flask apps. Uh, at least that's my opinion. Like I would totally, I would want to do that for any app that I'm running in production. So that covers the why. You know, let's kind of just experiment a little bit with using this. So if you look at the readme file here, it says like, how does it work? So step number one was like, you know, it adds that digest compile command, and then that gzips the files, and it'll also MD5 tags them. And then it also creates this thing called the cache manifest. And you know, we went over running that command before over here, but we didn't really look at the manifest file. So let's look at that manifest file now. Now, this is a little bit crazy looking on video here. The font size is a million, and I just don't happen to have a Vim plugin that can format JSON. And by the way, this file is machine generated, so you really shouldn't edit it by hand. So I don't even want to format it, even though technically formatting it would be okay. But uh, let's take a look here, like right over here, right? We have this style slash main.css. And basically this JSON file, it's like one big Python dictionary, but it's in a JSON format. So it's like a lookup table, right? Keys and values, that's it. There's no you know, lists here or arrays or anything like that. So we have this key here, which is styles slash main.css. And this maps over to styles main, and then there's like the MD5 hash, and, and there it is. Like, so this is, this is the actual lookup and this is the value. And if we go to, uh, let's see, uh, the base layout file for this template here, uh, if you take a look at the main.css file here, you'll notice that you know, we're now using a new template helper called static URL4. And if you go back to the readme file here, this is like the third piece to this extension. Like now we have this brand new template helper called static URL4. And uh, if we go back to that, if you are a Flask developer, like this template helper should look very, 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 very familiar to you. Like other than it being named a little bit different than what you're used to, like the way that we call it, like defining the static endpoint, passing in a file name, like style slash main.css, this is basically the same as just calling URL for that comes with Flask. But the only difference is now it's just been renamed to static URL for, and uh, it all works the same. So now we just pass in this file name of style slash main.css, and this is basically the key from that cache manifest file, and uh, it is going to look this up in the JSON file, and then it's going to be like, oh, well, you know, now, you know, here's the value to that, and then we look at our browser and the page source, and like it gets converted to this. Like this is the actual value, and that's what we just saw in the cache manifest file. Now, the manifest file itself gets created when you run that digest compile command, and then it gets loaded in once when you start your Flask server. So when you're actually doing, um, you know, like serving your static files, 
on the actual site itself, like it's never doing like an, a really expensive operation. All it's doing is one dictionary lookup to basically convert this uh, regular human readable file name into the one with the MD5 hash. And actually, if I go to the source code to this, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time in here, but uh, we can see here we have this one function here, static URL for. That's the new template helper that this ex extension adds. And uh, you can see here, like, if there's no manifest file, like we did not run that digest compile command, then it just literally just runs URL for uh, passing in the arguments over to Flask's URL for. And uh, that's what this Flask URL for is. At the top of this file here, you can see I'm just importing that from Flask. I just happen to name it with the uh, Flask underscore just so I know where it came from. Because there was a period of time where I was thinking like, you know, maybe I should just make this extension override the URL for from Flask instead of making a new template helper. But then I kind of figured that that's a little bit weird. Like Python is all about being explicit instead of implicit. So suddenly like if, if you have URL for it in your templates and it works differently than what it normally does, I didn't think that was a good pattern. So I decided to make my own function name. But uh, you can see here that, uh, yeah. So it basically just merges in the file name that you passed from the template helper. For example, like this is the file name here, like styles main that uh, CSS, and it just grabs that from like the quargs, basically the the keyword arguments. It's named values here because that's actually what it's named in the Flask source code. And uh, all it does here is like you know if that file exists, that file name, the style slash main dot CSS, then its value just becomes uh, a dictionary lookup. So like this self dot manifest is really just uh, a dictionary that is the JSON file loaded as a dictionary. And it just grabs that file. And, and now the, the, the actual value is the one with the MD5 hash. And then it, it uses like this Python 3.5 feature to merge both of these dictionaries. So like this file name gets, uh, well, this file name gets overridden with this one. And then now we just send it over to Flask's URL for just like normal. And it's it's super fast. That's what I'm trying to say. Like it's not going to make your application slower. If anything, it's going to make it faster because now it's like suddenly, uh, you know, your web server needs to do less work. And uh, yeah, it's all good stuff. So that's actually all explained here in the fact, like development versus produc production, like what's the performance implications and stuff like that. So I'm not going to bother narrating all this. This is all in the readme file. And by the way, this idea of like MD5 tagging your assets, like the tech term is called cache busting. And you may have heard about that in the past. And there's other ways to implement this. Like another way that I've seen people do this before is uh, they put like the M time of the file as like a query string into the uh, the asset. So like they'll put like a question mark M time equals and then there's like some timestamp there. But that has a couple of problems, right? It's like then it's like every time you load the page, then you need to do the work of like making an OS system call to look at the M time of the file and then like append that to a query string in your template. Like that has runtime performance implications. I don't know how much that's going to be, but it's certainly not a great idea to do that. Uh, and it's not so much because like the like performance is going to get worse. It's also like not a robust solution. Like certain web servers and proxies won't even take query strings into account. Like the, the part that comes after the question mark when it comes to determining like you know, did this file change or not? Like with cache headers, uh, it treats it as the same file. So like it wouldn't even work in some cases. So that's why we want to really generate, you know, completely individual files for this. And then we just, you know, have the new template helper to, to look them up. So yeah, I mean, that kind of covers how it all works. Uh, it, you know, there are some configuration options you can you can pass in if you'd like. So right now it will do the MD5 tagging on all of your files. Uh, but if you want to ignore some of them, like maybe ignore text files or HTML files in your static files, then you can just pass in a list of that to this. And this is something you can just configure with your Flask app, like in a, you know, like a settings.py file, like wherever you decide to put your configuration. Also, if you don't want it to be gzipped, then you can just set this to false and uh, it just won't gzip any files. So the readme file, yeah, it just goes through like, you know, before and after, like how to use certain things, like Maybe also like if you're not using a webpack, it may be a good idea. Well, it would be a good idea to git ignore the the uh, MD5 tagged versions of the files as well as the gzip file. 
files and the cache manifest. So you can just add all of these to your git ignore. <clears throat> also, there's another command too that we didn't really talk about, but you know, this is the clean command. So just like compiling, cleaning does the opposite. So it'll take all of those, um, well, I don't know if you heard that, but my neck just crack, cracked pretty good. So if you take a look here at the sidebar now, uh, I just cleaned all of these digested files, like the MD5 tagged ones, and uh, they all disappeared. So previously we had them here, but now they're gone. So that's what the clean command does. And uh, cleaning could be kind of useful in some cases. So it's like, you know, let's say that you have a CSS file and you decide to change it, then uh, if you run the compile command again, then you're going to get a new MD5 hash. So it's suddenly it's like you would have two gzipped and two MD5 hashed main.css files. And, you know, it really depends on like what type of application you're developing. But in some cases, you know, if you don't care that the old assets will 404, then you might want to clean your digested files every once in a while, possibly even as like an automated step. Like you might want to clean them and then compile them or something like that. Speaking of which, so in the Docker file, uh, this project uses Docker. Uh, I basically automated this compile process step as part of the Docker file. So basically, like if you build this Docker image and you have your Flask environment not set to development, so basically if it's set to production or anything that's not development, then uh, this compile command is going to be just run for you automatically. So your assets will be ready to go without you even needing to worry about running it. But if you're not using Docker, then yeah, you'll want to run this as part of your deploy process. So that's basically this extension in a nutshell, kind of a long video, I know. And also like, you know, if you were using Flask Webpack in the past, you know, here's like a little migration guide. It's very simple. Just remove a couple of things, add a couple of things, replace a couple of things. And uh, yeah, let me know how it goes in the comments. You know, if you have any issues setting this up or maybe you have some feature requests, feel free to open them up over here or uh, make a comment on the video. And with that, with that said, thanks again for watching, and I will see you in the next video.